right, happy Easter, and um, out of all the places you could be today, out of every church you could have been at, you're here, and we want to welcome you. We're so glad that you can be here with us. We do want to take just one moment to welcome you guys that are joining us on our live stream or at another time online, and uh, we're so glad you guys can be part of our Easter service as well. Wish you could be here because it's very festive here, but we're glad you guys can be online, and so drop us a comment. We'd love to know. Tell us Happy Easter or whatever you want to say, and uh, we, we love for you guys being part of our service. So we're so glad you're here today. What I want us to do today is this. I want us to kind of go on a walk back to the first Easter. And I got to tell you, it may be a little bit different than what you are expecting for the first Easter. <laughs> At least I, I thought it was. But I do believe this, that God has a word for somebody today. So Luke chapter 24, in the Gospel of Luke chapter 24 and verse 13, it says this. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. It says that same day. So I want to kind of just explain what day that was. The day they're talking about is the day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. That just two days before, he had died on the cross for the sins of the world, and then he stayed in the ground for two days, and then he rose from the dead. And these people were taking a walk. Now, these are people that were followers of Jesus that had been waiting to see if Jesus would come back. They were pretty distraught. And so now they're walking seven miles. Now, the number seven in the Bible, is it means completion. That's usually what seven means. God took seven days to create the earth and all that. But they're walking seven miles in the wrong direction. <laughs> they're walking away from all the action and what had happened and we're thinking of Resurrection Sunday like it's so great, but they're all downcast. They're all sad because they've lost Jesus and they've waited and they've waited and they waited about as long as they thought they could. And now they're leaving hopeless, walking out on a dusty country road. Does anybody know about those? <laughs> if you're watching online, you might not know, but our area, right? They're full of them. Some of you guys live on a dusty country road, right? <laughs> And they're walking seven miles away from Jerusalem, the big city, to a little town in the middle of nowhere called Zunot. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about where we live, right? I mean, sorry. Sorry. If you live there, I'm sorry. No, I'm just playing. I'm not sorry. <laughs> right? In the middle of nowhere. Seven miles in the wrong direction. If you went to Emmaus, you wouldn't know you'd went to Emmaus. Why did they end up in a place like Emmaus? Because... They're distraught. They have no idea what they're doing. Let me ask you a question. Where are you going today? What, 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 what's going on for you today? I know we've had a lot of festive stuff, but it might shock you that the first Easter, it was a celebration and it wasn't. You see, the problem was no, nobody was really there when Jesus rose from the dead. I mean, the guards were, but they got kind of knocked out, they say. And so nobody was there, just Jesus. And now everybody else is distraught, and they're walking the wrong way. And I got a feeling that's maybe where somebody's at today, but I believe God wants to kind of flip the script, and so we're going to kind of see what happens. Okay, so here we go. Verse 14. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. <laughs> so they're walking, you get the picture, and Jesus walks up and starts to talk with them. He starts to walk with them. <laughs> now, it, while they're walking the wrong way, okay? Does that make sense? Now, that's not exactly where I would have thought Jesus would be, okay, on an Easter Sunday, the first Easter Sunday. I mean, this is the greatest event in the history of mankind, that Jesus died for the sins, but not only died, but rose from the dead. I mean, he's a little bit busy, right? I mean, like, maybe you go to the hospital and get checked out. I mean, like, literally, an hour before this, he was in the ground, dead. And now, the first place he goes, it's not the first people that he appeared to, but it's some of the first people, and he goes way out on a country road. Maybe that's not how you envisioned Easter, right? <laughs> You know, 
that, that you would be out there, I mean, away from the crowd. You could appear before a whole bunch of people. You could appear before prominent people. But instead, you're going after people that kind of stopped believing. Does that make sense? I don't know if that makes sense to you, because they're not heading towards where resurrection happened. They're heading away from it. Let me ask you again. Where are you going? Where are you at? Okay. The first thing I want you to see is this, is that Jesus gave his presence. Not present. Somebody got an Easter basket. I don't know who that was, but are you going to share that, by the way? <laughs> It's Easter. You should. I mean, throw some up. I'm done. (laughs) You don't want to give me sugar. Uh, Not a present, his presence, who he is. He's there with them, but they really can't see it. Like I said, all the places he could have been. You know what makes me think of? It's like Super Bowl Sunday, and and the guy that's at the Super Bowl every time, Tom Brady. I'm sorry. Does does anybody like Tom Brady? (laughs) Okay. I see that one hand, <laughs> right? The rest of us, we don't like it. But if Tom Brady said, hey, Super Bowl Sunday next year, which he'll probably be there even though he says he's retired, but he's not retired. I don't know. Is he retired? He'll be there, right? And he says, I want to eat lunch with you on Super Bowl Sunday. You'd be like, what? Jesus, what are you doing? you got 40 days, and we know this from Scripture. He's got 40 days to do everything to start the church where he's going to ascend back into heaven, and you're spending your time going out here? These guys aren't even dressed right for church, right? Some of you guys say, you're not dressed right for church. you got flip-flops on. Can I say one comment about that? I mean, if Jesus could wear flip-flops, okay, I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> just, just saying, okay? The first Easter, the first Easter wasn't in a church. The first Easter wasn't festive like we have here. And there's nothing wrong with festive. I like it, right? I mean, like the candy's good, the stuff is good, the music's good, all that kind of stuff. That's great. But that's not where it happened. It happened on a country road going the wrong way. And he gave them his presence. But they couldn't recognize it. And I think that's where somebody's at today with all the stuff going on and how excited we get and all this kind of stuff. There's somebody here that you're not feeling it, right? Your presence. Let me, let me, let me go further why they didn't do it. But, but they were kept from recognizing it. <laughs> See, that wasn't me saying it. That, that was the Bible. But they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing together? As you walk along, what are you discussing as you walk along the road? What, what is this you're talking about? And you know what they said? Oh, they stood there with their face downcast. Downcast. That's the part I wanted you to see. They stood with their face downcast. You know why they couldn't see him? You know why they didn't recognize him? Because they were looking down, they were about what was happening. <laughs> where, where are you looking? Where are you looking? You see, um, religion kind of says this. We, we sing songs about, you know, hey, if you walk with God, you know, he walks with me and he talks with me, that kind of stuff. I don't know if you grew up with that, but I did. And it's a good song. And we have paradigms that say, hey, if you seek God, he'll, you'll find him, right? That's what religion says. There's nothing wrong with that. But can I tell you, this busts all the paradigms. That God, they they weren't coming towards God. In fact, they were walking away. They kind of stopped believing. They were hopeless because they're walking away from resurrection. But they can't see that Jesus is with them. You see, one of the things I see is this, is that sometimes we have the wrong paradigm in the way we look at things religiously, if that is. And I mean, I'm a pastor, so you can't get much more religious than that, right? And so, so let me tell you why. Sometimes I even say it too, and I think we've said it. And if you've said it, I'm not picking on you. I get what we're trying to say. But we'll say this, God, we welcome your presence. You ever heard that? <laughs> Sorry. And you know what God's saying? I'm already here. You just don't recognize it. You're not welcoming my presence. I never left. I'm here. Somebody needed to hear that today, but you can't see it. And God's about to do something in your life as he is in theirs. They couldn't recognize it because they're looking down. You see, some of us are expecting, (laughs) maybe you came here today and you were expecting that God is going to be this, right? Lightning bolts pound me. 
that you're finding the loving arms of God. He's actually coming for them. That's grace. Grace says he'll come after you even when you're going the wrong way down an old dirt country road. It sounds a lot like where we're at, right? He's coming for you today. Okay. Verse 18. One of them named Cleopas. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe that was a cool name in his day. Anybody having a kid? Here's a name, really. I mean, like, if you don't know what to name him, Cleopas, this is not coming back. All right. Cleo. Some of you guys got somebody named Cleo. If your name's Cleo, sorry. All right. No, I'm just sorry. That's your name. All right. We'll just leave it. <laughs> Are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Are you the only one that doesn't know? It's like if somebody said, What's going on in Ukraine? Like, what are you living on another planet? I mean, like, how could you? I mean, like, what, what's okay, right? But, but they're asking him, right? You see the irony of it? <laughs> they're telling Jesus. They're telling Jesus about what's happening. That's interesting, right? They're calling God a visitor. <laughs> You see what I mean about the presence? Verse 19. What things, he asks, about Jesus of Nazareth. I want to pause there, though, just to say, you know what Jesus does? He says, what things? If there was ever a person that understood how to communicate in counseling, you know who did? Jesus. If there's ever a person that could teach us how to communicate, if you read the words of Jesus, you will learn how to better communicate to people. It's a fact. Because you know what he's doing? He's going, I could tell you everything that I... I could tell you everything. You know, the problem sometimes is we, we give the advice too quick. That's what church people like to do, right? Because we got it and it's burning inside of us and we want to tell. And we think the information will be transformational, but it's not information that is. It's relational. And Jesus takes his time. And you know what Jesus does? He pauses and he goes, let me help you. Let me let you unpack your bags. Tell me what you know. Tell me, let me, let me hear your perspective. Maybe that's where you're at today. You got a perspective. You're broken. And these words might be the same ones that you have. He says, what happened? And they said this about Jesus of Nazareth. (laughs) That's ironic, isn't it? They're talking about Jesus of Nazareth to Jesus of Nazareth. (laughs) Okay. I thought it was funny. He was a prophet, powerful in words and deeds before God and all the people. He was what? He was. He was. They're talking to him in the past tense. You know, in the book of Revelation, it says about Jesus, it says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last who was and is and is to come. And they're talking about him. He was. Hmm. You know what one of our problems is? Some of us are stuck in what was and we can't see what is. That's where they are. Okay. Verse 20. Before we get to verse 20, before I read it, I got to tell you, Jesus is about to flip the script. I think he's going to do it for you too. You see, you can't receive the word that God has for you today if you're stuck in your perspective. If you want what you've been having, and I think there's somebody here that needs this. I don't know who, maybe not everybody, who knows? but I know there's somebody. (laughs) I believe it. There's somebody, you're stuck in your perspective. And you keep telling God your perspective. And you're thinking, John, you can't be talking to me because you have no idea the complexity of my situation. And Jesus is going, I know, but if you would stop talking and listen to mine for a minute, I, I know, I want you to unpack it, but I don't want you to keep unpacking it. Because thinking the same thoughts are going to keep getting you, right? If you keep doing what you've been doing, you're going to keep getting what you've been getting. If you keep thinking what you've been thinking, you're going to keep right there. And you're thinking, well, if God will work in my framework, and Jesus is saying, I'm not going to work in your framework. And i got to tell you, this may not be the easiest thing to hear. So they, they finish it up, and Jesus is about to do the script. But, but I want to share, they said the chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day 
since all this took place. You see, they were hoping, because that's their perspective. You see, I was hoping I'd be further along. I I was hoping that, that this wouldn't be this. I was hoping that he was Messiah that there would be hope in my life. But, but what I see in my life isn't that, right? Somebody, I, I thought I'd be married by now, but, but I'm not. I, I, thought, I thought I'd be over my addiction right now, but the truth is it keeps pulling me back in, right? Somebody, somebody you know, I hoped. You see, because they're having a, a third-day crisis. Oh, we want to flip the script, but you got to hear this part. You don't understand why that's so significant to them. Well, I thought he already died, so why on the third day? Because in their tradition, I don't know how they come up with this, but I I think I know. But anyway, I'm going to guess. And being I'm online, I better be careful. Anyway, um, my thought is, is that the Jewish people in those days, they didn't have a lot of medical treatments like we do now. And so they would wait three days before they actually said the person on the third day, they say, oh, the person's really dead. Because they probably had seen somebody not so dead, and you don't want to bury them when they're not dead. That's really, okay, we won't talk about that. But, But you get the idea, right? That's exactly where they're at, third day. They believe that the body hovered over the soul hovered over the body for three days that's what they believed and on the third day it's done that's why they were leaving we've waited as long as we can that's where somebody's at you think you've waited as long as you can (laughs) and god had a different timeline can i tell you something about god his timing is perfect his divine delays are perfect you see jesus resurrection he didn't want there to be any doubt it was resurrection. It wasn't just somebody that might have died. He was in the ground for two days. That's longer than anybody else. And they had lost hope. And they started walking. They had a crisis of faith. And I think that's where somebody's at. And now Jesus is ready to flip the script. He's ready. Okay. In addition, some of the women amazed us. We're not, at the, we're not ready to flip the script yet? Huh? In addition, some of our women amazed us. I don't know if my wife's here, but our women are amazing, aren't they? Could you tell her I said that? Okay. <laughs> I've said so many things here, and you guys tell her everything I say, so maybe you could say that. And, uh, it might help my game. It might help my game a little. Okay. Um, they, <laughs> they went to the tomb this morning, the women. Okay. But they didn't find his body. They went to the tomb but didn't find his body. They came and told her told them that they had seen a vision from angels who said he was alive, but they didn't see him. Then, then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they didn't see him. <laughs> They're talking to Jesus about people who couldn't see Jesus. They're talking to Jesus about people who didn't see Jesus. You get the irony? Is that true of you? They didn't see. You see, we think if I had the presence of God in my life, it would change me. But the truth is, it won't until you get the right perspective. And Jesus is ready to give the perspective. Are we ready now? Because I know I've, I've taken my time with this, right? You know why I did it? Because I know how, you, how we're going to do. Not, not just you, me too. I know God, but I I, I know, but this is not the right situation. This isn't how it should be working. That's my perspective, right? And God's about to give you a different one because you're thinking, I'm not just seven miles away. I'm 70 miles away from from it. I'm 700. I'm 7,000 miles away from it. You have no idea how far I am, but God's about to do something. And we need to hear it. Here's what he says. He said to them, how foolish you are. Jesus, (laughs) Jesus, <laughs> I mean, come on, man. I got to preach this stuff. Man, don't do that. That just offended everybody in the room, right? You want to hear Jesus' perspective on your perspective? You're foolish. Not you, your thought. Just want to be clear. That's why I said he's about to change something. He's saying, I hear you. There's something you should have known that you don't know. And, I, and, I, and he knows why you don't know. That's why he let them unpack their bags, just like you. There's something you don't know that he does. You know what it is? He knows something that you should have known. There was things that were said that you missed because you're looking in the moment. You're looking right here. And he's saying, no, no, it's much bigger than that. And he told them, he said what? He said, how foolish you are. How slow to believe. 
How slow to believe that the prophets have spoken. What the prophets have spoken. You see, he's doing something here. There's a big movement right now in faith to move away from the Bible as though it's not important. But I got to tell you, you'd have to do away with most of what Jesus said if that's what you want to do. Because every time he references anything, you know what he says, as it was written, the prophets. He's not just talking about people. He's talking about the word of God that God gave them. And he said, this was all information you guys had. Not to mention, he doesn't, you know, one thing he didn't do was to go, I said that. You were there when I said I'll be in the ground for two days and I'll rise again. Remember when I said that they'll destroy this temple, meaning me, and I'll rise it back up, and, and, but you guys just wouldn't listen. You just you couldn't hear it because you're so focused on the way you see it, your paradigm, and I want to give you mine. It was already prophesied. And then he goes on to say this. This is, this is big. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things? That was prophesied, by the way up to how he was crucified. We just did a whole series. If you missed that, you can go back. And we talked about all the things and how prophetic it was that, that he fulfilled all these things. Didn't it say that the Messiah would suffer many things and then enter into his glory? You know what I think it's saying to us? Is that resurrection doesn't happen in pretty places. <laughs> Somebody needed that word today. You see, you want God's miracle, but you don't want the crisis. <laughs> But you know when miracles happen? In crisis. Did you know that? That's the only time they happen. No crisis, no miracle. God doesn't do miracles just to be cool. God does a miracle for people that need it, but we can't see it. So we go, if I can understand it, if I can apprehend it, if I can, if I can put it in my nice little box, in my perspective, in my paradigm, and he's going, how foolish your paradigm is. Let me open your eyes to a new paradigm because God can do things that you cannot. And he wants to. And he did. And he's saying it has to happen that way. You see, here's what I know. We get stuck in crucifixion while we're standing in front of resurrection. You see, the Christian faith, the symbol is not the cross. It's the cross and the empty tomb. Did you miss that? <laughs> Maybe you've been to church that way, right? Did you think we invited you here today for a funeral? Did you think today is a celebration of his, his life way back when? God didn't invite you here for a funeral. That's why we want it festive. You go, oh, this one won't like church. We got candy. We got stuff. Why don't you do all this? Because it's a happy place. Today is a celebration. It, a lot of times, most of the world doesn't even understand. How could you celebrate somebody's death? And I don't want to take away from the passion of Christ. We spent seven weeks unpacking the passion of the Christ. And his last words on the cross and what he was doing there. And all of that is amazing. But here's the thing. If it's only that, you are stuck. You're stuck in crucifixion. And you're standing in front of resurrection. Are you ready? Are you ready for resurrection? Are you resurrection ready? <laughs> are you ready for something different in your life? I just told you, right, it doesn't happen in pretty places. Maybe you're not in a pretty place, and you're going, God couldn't be talking to me. Can I tell you, the first Easter Sunday, he wasn't in a church. He wasn't dressed up. He was walking down an old dirt country road with some people that didn't believe. They had stopped believing. They weren't singing. They weren't giving out Easter eggs. That's such a shame. They were just in a terrible place. And he was there. And he's given them his perspective. Okay. Verse 27. And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scripture concerning himself. <laughs> that would be amazing to hear. So if you'll give me the next three hours, like Jesus said, right? Seven miles. How long does it take to walk seven miles? I don't know. I ran seven miles this morning and I made it, but, but, uh, but to walk it, that takes a little bit longer, right? He spent some time, man. They're like, dude, we're got to eat. We can't. Okay. They clearly were not Baptists. Okay. <laughs> if I know Emmaus Baptist Church, no, no, no. <laughs> All right. They have to be out. The Holy Spirit stopped working at noon. All right. Got you. <laughs> right? It's Easter. We can go as long. No, we can't. All right. Okay. I got you. And you're right. You're not Jesus. I got you. All right. He, he told him. 
everything that scripture was saying. You, that's why I told you the scripture's so important. But you know what he's doing through all of that? He's giving them his perspective. His perspective. Not theirs, his. He's showing them even through the scriptures to say, you haven't seen it. <laughs> You've been looking at it through your paradigm, through your lens. Let me show it to you through mine. And all of a sudden, the scriptures came alive for the first time in their life because, you see, they couldn't see his presence until they got his perspective. Somebody needs that. Because you're going, where is God? He's with you. But my life doesn't look like anything like I thought it should. I know. Did I tell you resurrection doesn't happen in pretty places? Hmm. That's some good stuff. All right. As they approached the village, as they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going to go further. <laughs> so they were walking seven miles. They get to the small village, and Jesus kept going because they were like, there's nothing here. Okay, no. There's no Dairy Queen in Zoo, not. Okay. <laughs> there's no Chick fil A. <laughs> Forsaken by God. <laughs> Sorry, I'm done. <laughs> we got to hurry up. <laughs> it's going to get bad. He acted like he was going to go further, but here's the part I want you to see. But they urged him strongly. They urged him strongly, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in and he stayed with them. Hmm. You see, I just believe there's somebody here today. Maybe you're watching online right now. Maybe that's why you're not here. That... You're going through something. And if you would invite Jesus, he'll stay with you. He hasn't given everything yet. He's getting ready to. He's, ready, he's getting ready to give something amazing. But, but I just need to, I need to hear this part. If you'll invite him, he'll stay with you. You know what it says in the book of Revelation? It says this. It says, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone opens the door and lets me in, I'll come in. And I'll eat with that person. I'll explain the eating in just a minute, but I just want you to know it's not you seeking God. <laughs> it's God seeking you. Seven miles in the wrong direction that Jesus is literally taking the time when he only has a, a Jesus, you got a busy calendar. You got time for these people that don't believe. That's not what he said, though. See? <laughs> he came back after him. Just moments after he'd been in the ground, he's spending time with them, helping them. So he went in and he stayed with them. They invited him in. And then it goes on to say this. When he was at the table, when he was at the table, he took the bread and gave thanks. <laughs> now, that wouldn't mean anything unless you, if, unless you understand their customs. So I just want to explain it. It would be like inviting somebody over for Thanksgiving dinner and you get ready to cut the meat, but instead your, your guest grabs the fork and knife. And I'm like, dude, this is my table, right? I mean, <laughs> you don't touch my carbon knife. I might not be good at it, but it's mine, right? That's what Jesus was doing, right? Jesus was a guest. They didn't know who he was. He knew them. He'd known them for a while. These, these weren't his 12 disciples, but they were part of the 100 people that followed him, Cleopas, Cleo, right? <laughs> How redneck can it get? Cleo was there, and he just, you know, he had been with them. Jesus knew him. They didn't know him. He still hadn't seen him. They still were so downcast, they couldn't see him. They didn't recognize him. And Jesus, when he comes into the house, instead of waiting for the host, it's the normal thing to do, he does something that is totally unconventional. He grabs the bread and prays over it. <laughs> uh, that's weird for everybody except Jesus that's holding the bread in his hand. You know what bread represents, right? It represents life. You know, he prayed, give us this day our daily bread. Give me this day our daily bread. You know what he said in another place? He said, I am the bread of life. If you eat of me, you will never be hungry again. I am what you really need. That's what he's saying. And he broke the bread and he began to give it to them. Where he had just been broken. You do know that, right? Just hours before he laid in the grave. And he's breaking the bread. But you know when they, you know when they knew who he was? Not on the road. Because you see on the road, you can walk like this. 
I think Jesus did. He was probably cool, right? <laughs> he had his hands in his pocket, <laughs> walking behind him, thinking it was really kind of, I don't know, he might most have thought it was funny for seven miles and you don't even know who I am. But when he broke the bread, it's hard to hide, isn't it? When he handed it to him, you know who I am now, right? When you saw the narrow pierced hands, it opened their eyes. See, I think you need God to touch you today, right? <laughs> and he wants to. In fact, here's what it says. Then their eyes were open. Then their eyes were open. You see, they saw it, right? And they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. What? He left them. Yeah, he's busy, man. I mean, like I said, he's got 40 days to get all this done. And he's spent a whole bunch of time. I don't know how fast they were walking, but my guess would be is if it takes me an hour and 10 minutes to run seven miles, I bet it is a lot longer if you're walking, right? He's like, I'm busy, dude. <laughs> but you know who I am now, right? Just change your life like that. Same as he could do you. Same as he could do you. You know what, what, what took? They had to have their perspective changed. You see, here's what we want. In fact, you can write it down if you want to. He, Jesus wants to give you his power. That's where we want to start. But you can't have his power until you have his presence. Maybe I should say it different, until you recognize his presence. But you can't recognize his presence until you have his perspective. And I think he just gave both. I think he just gave both. My question for you today is this. Do you need hope today? Not hype. Oh, we had a bunch of that. I'm, I'm, I'm good with hype. Hype is good, right? I, I'm not saying hype is bad. In fact, <laughs> this is going to sound so bad. Okay, I'm going to say it anyway. Hype is what church does. I think it's okay to say. Enthusiasm. There's no, no problem with that. There's no problem with hype. We got candy. We're welcoming people. You're feeling the momentum. That's good. We're dressed up, we're, we're doing it, we're singing, we're doing all this stuff, and hype is good. And when we're together, we can feel the hype. You're not here for hype, you're here for hope. There's a difference. Hope means when nobody's there. Hope means when you're at the last, it's past time, when it feels dead, right? When there's no wind, when there's nothing, when the situation is impossible. And it's only you and God. That's where Jesus walks in. <laughs> and he says, is this enough? Hmm? You see, what I want to tell you about today is it's a comeback story. Did you know? Jesus came back so that they would get it. He could have let them walk on and, and save many other people. He could have appeared in Jerusalem to all the people waiting there. But he didn't. He does later. He makes the people in Jerusalem, they're waiting. <laughs> they're waiting. Their body is gone, and they don't know where he is. And can I tell you, maybe this is part of the story you never realized. The disciples are waiting to see the resurrected Christ, and they go, the body's not there. Where is he? Why isn't he coming to us? And he's busy with Cleo. You. You hear me? If he could do it for Cleo, he can do it for you. He's not offering hype. He's offering hope wherever you're at. I told you resurrection doesn't happen <laughs> in pretty places. Maybe you needed to hear that today. I want to show you how it ends. Verse 32. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while we talked, while he talked with us on the road and he opened the scriptures to us? Well, let me ask you, is your heart burning within you? Not, not for my words, but for his. And they did what? They got up and they returned at once to Jerusalem. <laughs> it's a comeback story. They were walking the wrong way and Jesus took the time with them to give them the right perspective so they could see his presence and they could have his power and then they came back. 
You see, they were, they were walking the wrong way. You see, he's saying, you are missing it. I told you I would rise from the dead. The prophets told you I would rise from the dead. I rose from the dead. And if you leave Jerusalem, you see, he told his disciples, after this happens, wait for me. And they thought, well, I waited. But they only waited three days. You see, then they missed him. They missed him. By the way, when he goes back, you know where they go? You can read the rest of the story. The 11 disciples were waiting there, and they show up, and you know who comes? Jesus. You know who would have missed it if he came there? Cleopas. Cleopas wouldn't have been there if Jesus hadn't come and got him. And then he comes back, and when they're together, the power of God is in that room. And by the way, 50 days from that day, they waited in Jerusalem, and the power of the Holy Spirit of God came for the first time. They would have missed it if Jesus hadn't come for them. That's the power of resurrection. It's a comeback story. So let me ask you a question. Do you need them today? It's a comeback story. You recognize them today? I am the bread of life. I'm what you really need. We're going to talk about a lot of things in this series, but, but you see, the provision that we really need is him. None of this works without him. None of this works without a relationship with God. You might think there's all kinds of things, but I got to tell you, he's what we really need. And I have a feeling there's somebody here, you're so far from God, or you feel like you are. You don't see his presence. Maybe it's your fault, and you feel guilt, and you feel like God could never forgive me for the things that I've done. And I think that's why him holding the bread of life out with a nail-pierced hand might help you that there's nothing that the blood of Jesus Christ can't cover. That for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He died for you, but he also rose for you, and he's coming after you. <laughs> That's what today is about. You might be saying, well, John, I don't know about that, right? Where is he? That's great for Cleopas. He was there. I don't see him. He didn't, he didn't walk with me at Zuna today, <laughs> Where is he? Do you know? He spent 40 days, just like I said. He died on the cross. He rose from the dead. He spent 40 days appearing before people, and then he ascended back into heaven. You're like, a lot of good that does me. Can I tell you what he does there? It says that after he came back, like a high priest, he sat down, unlike any other high priest, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, meaning the most powerful place there is. And you know what he does with that power? It says he prays for you. <laughs> It's a comeback story. Come back to Jesus. Are you ready? He, he will do for you what I cannot. He'll do for you what this church cannot. It's not us inviting you to him. It's him inviting you to him. And all you have to do is receive him. It's his love. You see, religion teaches that you need to love God. But, you know, I just read this morning in Second John, or First John chapter 2. Happened to be my quiet time. It's very ironic. I didn't plan it that way. And it says right there, it says that it's not about you loving God. It's about God loving you. Maybe you need to hear that today. There's no, no sin that Jesus Christ can't cover. There's no resentment that he can't help you forgive. There's nothing that's too much for him. Give your life to him. It's a comeback story. Come back to him. You know, there's one other person, the one that's far from him. Maybe you've never known him. Come, come to him. But somebody, you need to come back. You do realize Cleo was a follower, and he left. That's where somebody's at today. And you think, hey, I had it once, but you know, now I kind of walked away. I don't think I can have it again. You know what this story's telling you? On the first Resurrection Sunday, his presence has never left you. You just don't see it. You're, because you're, you're, you're heading in the wrong way, and Jesus is right beside you. You just don't see him because you're downcast. You're focused on circumstances. You're focused on impossibility. You're focused on your perspective, not his. And if you would only turn to him, you know what repentance really means? It sounds like a great religious word. If I sweated a lot <laughs> and screamed it, it isn't this. It's this. You do know he's there, right? He's saying, come. He ain't doing this. Yeah, your thoughts are foolish. He's not doing this, though. He's saying, your thoughts are foolish. Are you ready for a different life? Are you ready for something different? I love you right where you are and too much to leave you there. Come back. 
So two things I want you to come back to. The first one is Jesus. If you've never invited him into your life, you can pray with us. No, we're going to pray. In fact, you don't even have to wait. It's him that's inviting you, not us. Receive him. If you need help with that, come see us. Come see us after the service and we'll pray with you. If you're online, call us. I'll give you a number. You can call us and we'll call you back after service. Just leave us a message. It's 757-986-0808. I just want to make sure you have the opportunity. Don't do this alone. Come back to Jesus and come back next week. You hear me? We got a lot more. We're going to talk about empty checkbooks next week. (laughs) How God can fill your life might be different than what you're planning. It was different than what I planned, even as I started thinking about the message and God took me in a whole different direction. But I got a word to share with you next week about that provision. We're going to talk about an empty earth. You see all the signs of the times and all that stuff. We're going to put it together. We're going to figure out what it means. And then we're going to talk about, in the last one, empty relationships. But before you can have all that, you need to come back. And you can't have any of that if you're not together. And it's not about the church doing what only Jesus can do. It's saying, you don't have to do this alone. Can I tell you what they did? They came back. They came back to the 11 disciples that were left. And they were there. And I believe they were there 50 days later when the day of Pentecost happened. And they would have never received the power of the Holy Spirit of God because you cannot do that alone. We know that because it wasn't until they came together in that upper room and they waited 10 days that the power of God came in the harmonics is what it talks about. The harmony together. And only when they were together would God come. And somebody, you're trying to do this life all alone. It's not going to work. So come back. Otherwise, you know what happens? We'll see you again next Easter. Just being real. Oh, you you got the hype. You just don't have the hope because it's going to be stolen from you as you do life alone. Don't do it alone. I know all about that. I did life alone for a long time. Even as a very religious person, it about devastated us until I learned. A group of men came around me and helped me understand there's something different. You you don't have to do this alone anymore. You don't either. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask everybody to pull out this card that's right in front of you. And I'm going to ask you to fill it out. And if you decided to follow Jesus today, or you're getting ready to, maybe you haven't even done it, but it's okay to go ahead and do it and check it. I made a commitment to follow Jesus. It's right here on the first line. (laughs) I recommitted my life to Jesus. If you did that, or you're getting ready to do that, check it. And then I want you to check one other box. It says explore. You know what it is? It's just a breakfast next Sunday at 915. That's all that it is to help connect you to one person. Okay. We'll answer questions you have about the church. That's fine. If you have no questions and you just go, I just want to connect, that's fine. We're not going to pressure you. It's not a timeshare salesman pitch. It's not a new member's class. It's simply a breakfast to help you connect to the church so you don't have to do this alone. But I'm going to tell you, this is what makes it real, isn't it? Right? Other than that, you just got hype. I'm not saying Jesus is hype. But how many of us has accepted him as Savior, but we're not following? Because you're trying to do it alone. You know what? These guys couldn't do it alone. After they had seen Jesus, after he appeared before them, they went back. And you know what? When they came back together, they saw Jesus again. Just saying. You get it? Can I tell you what the day's for? It's a comeback story. Come back. Can I pray for us today? Let's stand for prayer. Father God, we come before you today. Lord, no day do we ever celebrate more than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But my prayer today is this, is that every person within the sound of my voice, and maybe even further, because it's not about my voice, it's about yours. Here is yours for a moment. That in Ephesians chapter 1, Lord, you say that the same power that it took to raise Christ from the dead is available to us. (laughs) yet some of us are stuck in crucifixion. And you're saying, I'm standing right in front of you. If you'd only let me resurrect you. Maybe it's a marriage. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a hurt. Maybe it's a sin. Maybe it's something that's more impossible than all of those things. Yet your blood can cover all of it. And your power from the resurrection is available to us. That's what you said in Ephesians, Lord. So we're putting it to the test today. Lord, I pray for the one that's far from you. Let them call out to you.
The one that's never known you. The one that's thinking, God can never forgive me for the things I've done. I've hidden all my life because of the things that I've done, and today is the day. They don't have to be honest with us. They just need to be honest with themselves. They don't have to be honest with you. You already know. You're already there. They don't have to invite your presence. You're there. We're not knocking on your door. (laughs) We're not knocking on heaven's door. Heaven's door is knocking on us. And all we have to do is receive it. Lord, I pray. Lord, let it be a comeback story. Somebody come back to Jesus as their perspective changes and they see you for who you are. Lord, open the eyes of their heart. Let them see you. And then, God, I pray they feel your power. I don't actually have to pray that, Lord. They will feel your power. So, God, I pray they don't keep that to themselves, that we all come back. Lord, if it's the breakfast, that's fine. If it's just to come back for the message next week, that's fine. Today is not about pressuring somebody into doing something, only to say, Lord, help us to connect to each other because I don't see it any other way, Lord. That's exactly what you did in the first century, and it really hasn't changed, Lord. We need each other. Not church being God. That's the big mistake. Religious people thinking they're our God and telling other people how to do it. We don't need another high priest. We have one, and it's Jesus Christ. (laughs) And, Lord, we all worship him together, but we don't have to do it alone. We can do it together. So I pray, give them the courage to come back. Lord, I I pray for one other person, Lord, the follower of Jesus that got off track. They know all the right answers, so none of this stuff surprises them. But maybe they feel far from God because they're stuck in their own paradigm. I pray, God, open the eyes of their heart too. Let them come back. Let them feel your presence. Let them feel your power. And let them know they don't have to do this alone. God, make us those kind of people. Make us that kind of church. Lord, conform us to the way you are. We'll give you all the honor and glory and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Guys, if you need prayer, we'll be here after the service. For everybody else, God bless you. Have a great week. Happy Easter.